Okay. All right, so uh, I think this is on. So I'm going to continue with the, um, with the optimization stuff. <laughs> okay, is this working? All right, okay, it's working. All right, it wasn't clear. Okay, so I'm going to continue with uh, optimization. So we were doing stochastic gradient yesterday. So let's just sort of back up a little bit to where we were when we left off, because it was a little bit of a rush at the end. So um, the setting here was that we're trying to minimize a function f, uh, which is, uh, I'm going to focus on this case, which is the sum of a bunch of fi's. And we'll do some examples later on where we talk about exactly what sort of fi's we're interested in here. But basically, it's a sum of a whole lot of these things. M is big, OK? And we were trying to approximate the gradient of f by just picking one of these fi's at random and taking a step based on, on that you know, very crude but unbiased approximation to the gradient. Uh, and there, there were some examples here. Um, we assumed that the f we were dealing with had this was strongly convex with this modulus mu, so it had curvature of at least mu, where mu is some positive, small, maybe small positive number. Um, uh, the algorithm was just basically this, that we were generating a sequence of iterates xk by taking one of these i's at random, ik, and taking a step of length alpha k, and we were going to talk about what the step length was. And the convergence we were analyzing was in terms of the expected squared error. So after k iterations, I look at the difference between xk and the solution x star, which of course we don't know, uh, take the square norm of that, uh, take the expectation, because every time we run this algorithm we get a different answer, because the sequence of random indices is going to be different every time. Uh, and then divide by half, one half for convenience. Assume that the, norm, the squared norms of the gradients are bounded, or the average squared norm of the gradient is bounded. And we show by these three pages of pretty elementary analysis, using very elementary you know, expectations and a few matrix inequalities and definition of strong convexity and so on, that if we choose the step lengths like this, alpha k is 1 over k times mu, where mu is, the, again, the lower bound on the curvature, k is the iteration number, we show if we make that choice by doing this very simple inductive argument, we end up with um, uh, being able to show that a k, the expected squared error, is, goes to 0 like 1 over k, essentially. So it's a sublinear rate but it's, it's definitely converging to zero. And the crucial thing here was making this choice of alpha k. So the alpha k's were going to zero, but not too fast. So if you sum up all the alpha k's, you'll get infinity, right? Because the sum of one over k, k going from one to infinity, is infinite. And that actually makes sense as we as came up in one of the questions yesterday, because if you start a long way away, if your initial letter at x1 or x0 is a long way from x star, you're going to have to move a lot of cro uh, across a lot of space to get to x star. So you don't want the sum of the alpha k's to be finite because that would limit how far you could actually move. So it makes sense that you, that you, need, it, you need this to not be decreasing too fast. The sum needs to be infinite to give you the potential to move arbitrarily far. Okay. So, so what, what's the problem with this particular choice of alpha with this 1 over k times mu? Well, for a start, you need to be dealing with strongly convex functions. Mu needs to be positive in order for this to work. And the other interesting thing about this is that if you get mu wrong, if you make an incorrect or inaccurate guess of the size of mu, the practical results you get with this approach can be really terrible. Okay, and this observation was made in this paper that I mentioned earlier by the, in the Nemirovsky et al. paper from 2009. Uh, they show that if you underestimate mu, if you're sort of too conservative about the choice of, of uh, uh, about your guess of strong convexity, the, the convergence becomes incredibly slow, okay? Uh, so this method is not very robust to the choice of mu. And so they propose in the same paper, they propose a robust version of stochastic approximation, which doesn't even require mu to be positive. It'll actually work on weakly convex functions. Uh, and a lot of the functions that we deal with, if you're doing, for example, a hinged loss, um, that's sort of a piecewise linear but not strongly convex function. So these robust approaches will work on weakly convex functions. They'll also work on strongly convex functions because they don't require an estimate of mu necessarily. Okay? 
And this is the approach. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this approach, this robust ver variant, uh, because it generalizes to the mirror descent algorithm. And I think quite a few people have heard of mirror descent. And I'll describe why uh, a special version of robust stochastic approximation is, in fact, mirror descent. Now, the robust algorithm doesn't converge as fast. We showed that the, the basic method that I just told you about converges like 1 over k. The robust method converges like 1 over square root of k in the function values, and that's not as fast, okay? Because 1 over k goes to 0 faster than 1 over square root of k. So if you're trying to decrease the error by a factor of 100, if you've got a 1 over k method, you need to take about 100 iterations. If you've got a 1 over square root of k method, you need to take... How many iterations? You get a decrease of a factor of 100. 10,000 iterations, yeah. So it's a lot more iterations, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, Right. I mean, in this, this analysis that I showed you, we assumed that there was a global mu that was always valid. But, of course, you've got interesting problems where the mu changes, where maybe in the neighborhood of the solution you have a tighter estimate of mu. Okay? And if that's the case, you could imagine sort of uh, enhancing this method to sort of periodically re-estimate mu or something, or to use additional knowledge that you have about a local mu and therefore restarting the method with a different choice of mu. And certainly you'd expect better performance if you've made better use of the structure. So, yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions at this stage? All right. So let me tell you about this robust stochastic method. So here's the idea. It, it generates the sequence the same as before, exactly the same kind of step. You pick an i at random. You take a step alpha k in the direction of i. But the thing is that you don't report the latest xk as your best guess of the solution. What you do instead is take a weighted average of all the xk's that you've seen so far up to this iterate, going right back to the very first iterate. And you weight the iterates according to the alpha i's, the step lengths, okay? And so you form these quantities x bar k, which are these weighted averages over everything you've seen so far. And what you do is analyze the convergence of x bar k. In fact, what we, do, what we look at is the function value at x bar k, and we look at how fast that approaches f of x star, which is the optimal function value. And if we co of course, we want this to go to zero. We want the difference between these two things to go to zero. Now, the choice of step length here is different. Uh, before, we used 1 over mu times k. Here, we're allowing mu to be zero, so mu doesn't enter into the step length. What we use instead is theta, where theta is, you can basically choose theta to be whatever you like. It's not really critical. But we divide it by m. m is the uniform upper bound on the squared gradients and times the square root of k. All right, so we have a different formula for step length. Again, the step length is decreasing. It's going to zero, but it's not going to zero as fast as 1 over k. It's going to zero much more slowly now. Okay? So the two things, we've got a slower, different choice of step length, and we're looking at the weighted average of the x's. Okay? These are the two things that make it uh, more robust in a sense. All right, so... What's the analysis? How many slides does this analysis take? <coughs> Three slides, okay? But again, it's all very elementary. Um, okay, I'm, you notice I'm very careful to use this word elementary. All right. So, uh, so okay. So, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I will try to run through this. Um, first of all, we have this inequality from a few slides ago. Where is it? See if I can find it again. Uh, I think it's this one here, okay? So if I take this inequality and I'm going to change the notation a little bit, looks like I'm using i instead of k, which is a little bit dangerous, but I've just taken that inequality and I've rearranged it. So again, ai here is the estimate of the squared error in x, okay? Uh, I've taken the kind of tricky term over to the left-hand side, I've taken the ai's over to the right-hand side, okay? So now, again, I'm going to mess around with um, okay, I'm going to mess around with this term. I'm going to try to replace this term by something different. Before, remember, in the, in the analysis right at the end of the last lecture, I put a lot of effort into figuring out a, a decent estimate of this term. Here we do a different estimate of this term. We use the convexity of f. I'm not using any strong convexity here. I'm just using convexity. And convexity tells me that f of x star is greater than or equal to uh, 
f of x i plus g i, where g i is a member of the subdifferential times x star minus x i. So this is, you remember the picture I drew of convexity, where if you've got a convex function like this, and suppose this is your point x i, that any supporting hyperplane, the slope of any supporting hyperplane is a member of the subdifferential of the function at this point. So if this is f of x and this is xi, then gi is a member of the subdifferential. And it may not be uniquely defined if this function is not smooth. So there might be multiple supporting hyperplanes to f, and each of these is a valid choice for gi. Okay? So now that I've got this, uh, you know, I'm just using the definition of supporting hyperplane, I can replace this guy with this without changing the inequality. I'm just replacing it by something smaller. And so I can just replace this guy with f of xi minus fx star times the alpha i here. And now I can do the telescoping sum trick. I can sum both sides from i equals 1 up to k. Okay? And telescoping sum, remember I used that last time in a different context, you get the ai's cancelling a lot in a telescoping sum. So after you sum from 1 to k, you've got a1 minus ak plus 1. Well, I've just dropped the ak plus 1 because it's positive, so I can drop it without changing the inequality. But then I've got the sum of all these terms, the sum of all the alpha i squareds, okay, times 1 half m squared. And on the left-hand side, I've got the sum of all these expectations, okay? Now, I'm going to work with that a little bit. So first of all, I'm going to take that sum that I just got, I'm going to divide both sides by the sum of the alpha i's, okay? So what happens to the left-hand side term? Well, the sum of the alpha i's, you notice that the coefficient of f x star is just the sum of the alpha i's times minus 1. So when I divide by the sum of the alpha i's, I've just got minus 1 here. Here I've got the weighted average of all the f's that I've seen so far, the f of x i's. Okay? And on the right-hand side, I've just got what I had before divided by the sum of the, of the alpha i's. Okay? Now, let's look at the sum of the, these weighted sum of the f i's. The definition of a convex function, I'm still assuming f is convex, if I take that definition I, ha I had right back at the start when I had those just the basic slides about convex functions, then this is just, uh, I can use that definition to show that the, the function value at the weighted average of the x's is less than or equal to the weighted average of the function values, right? So this is just an extension of the, when I define convexity, I just define it with two points, but I can extend that definition to, to a weighted average over k points. And, uh, and I'll get this inequality. So in other words, I can replace this guy with the, uh, with the function value at the weighted average of the x's. Okay, so I've just made that replacement going from here to here. And I haven't done anything yet to the right-hand side. All right, now I'll do stuff to the right-hand side. So now I, I substitute in the choice of alpha i's. So remember alpha k was theta over m times square root of k. Now I've just changed k to i. Uh, so I've made that substitution here and here, okay? And now this term, I remember in Zubin's talk yesterday, he was kind of uh, equivocating about the differences between sums and, and integrals. Well, here I'm taking the sum and I'm majorizing it by an integral because we all know that um, this sum here, it's like the integral of 1 over x from 1 up to k, or 1 over up to k plus 1. The integral of 1 over x is log x, right? So I can use that to sort of majorize, I can use log k plus 1 to majorize this sum, okay? In the denominator, I've done something different. I've just said, well, um, the denominator is a sum of positive terms. I'm just going to pick the smallest of those terms, right? And multiply that by k. So this sum here is, what is it? It's greater than or equal to uh, k times 1 over square root of k, all right? So if I make the denominator smaller, I'm making the whole thing bigger. That's how I always think of inequalities, right? So I've replaced the denominator by something smaller, therefore I'm making the whole thing bigger. And the thing I've replaced it by is k times 1 over square root of k, and that just becomes square root of k, all right? So I've majorized that, and now this is simply, um, uh, basically it's just 1 over square root of k. There's a log term, but usually we don't care about log terms. So what have I shown here? I've shown that the... the the rate at which the average value of f decreases to, x, to f of x star in expectation is around about, it's something times 1 over square root of k. Okay? So we've proved the result that I, 
uh, I promised you uh, three or four slides ago. So that's it. Again, very elementary analysis here, nothing fancy going on. All right, so I've shown you two variants of stochastic gradient. There's the original simple variant, there's the robust variant. Here's another variant uh, that again, it goes back to assuming strong convexity, but I wanted to point out that you, you can have variants that don't use decreasing step sizes, in, instead they use constant step sizes. But you have to sort of set things up a little bit differently. What you do if you want to use a constant step size is you sort of define a priori some threshold, epsilon, that you want to reach. Okay, So you no longer want to drive the error all the way to zero. You just say, okay, here's a tolerance I want to achieve. Uh, how many iterations should I take to achieve that tolerance? And what step length should I use? Okay, Now this is sort of, you know, not atypical in machine learning because in machine learning we're often not interested in driving the error all the way to zero. We're just working with an empirical approximation to a loss function. So we're often prepared to tolerate a fairly crude solution. Okay, So it sort of makes sense in that setting to consider inexact solutions. All right, so going back to this bound that I got a few slides ago, I'm going to use that bound and I won't work through the derivation of that again. But I'm going to uh, suppose now that I'm taking a constant step length. So instead of alpha k here, I've just got alpha. And I'm going to figure out what alpha needs to be. So if I take that bound and apply it recursively, going right back to the very first iteration, I can show that um, I basically get that AK is less than or equal to this quantity to the power K times the initial A0, okay, plus this term here. All right? And you can, you know, you can you have to do a little bit of arithmetic to get to there, but basically it's not very it's not very difficult. All right, so now the, the only trick is you want to figure out how big do I have to make k and how small do I have to make alpha to make this guy less than epsilon. So all I do is I just say, okay, let's make this term less than epsilon over 2 and let's make this term less than epsilon over 2. Very crude, right? So to get this term less than epsilon over 2, that tells me right away how I have to choose alpha. All right? I just say make this less than epsilon over 2. That's how I have to choose alpha. Okay? Now to make this term less than epsilon over 2, I plug in that value of alpha and then make k this big, all right? So if I make k that big, then that term's less than epsilon over 2 as well. So here's a third variant on stochastic gradient that works for st strongly convex functions, mu greater than 0, that uses constant step lengths and tells you how many steps to take to achieve a, a specified precision, okay? All right, uh, what's this about? All right, so... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this argument here, uh, this is just a little more detail on how I got this value of k. Basically, you take this and you take logs of both sides and use some simple bounds and so on. So I'll let you refer to this slide if you want some detail on that. Okay, so constant step size, uh, what's the pro? Well, the pro is that um, you, you, first of all, you avoid averaging. If you make an incorrect estimate of the modulus of strong convexity in this algorithm, you don't pay as much of a penalty as you did in the first variant that I told you about. So there's something to be said for using a constant step size. But the con is that you sort of need to estimate quantities that you often don't know. Okay, So you need to actually know what M is and know what A0 is. So I want to make the, appro I want to make the point here that all of this analysis that we're doing, it's kind of theoretical because when you implement stochastic gradient, you tend to just make some choice of alpha, or some, almost by trial and error very often. Because you can't really choose it in theoretically valid ways because often it's too slow and often you don't know a lot of these constants anyway. So when you see people writing papers on stochastic gradient, they often sort of very hazy about how they choose the step length. And that goes for me too. We just sort of try a bunch of step lengths and, you know, pick one that seems to work pretty well. Now, some of my colleagues have recently tried looking at doing that in a more rigorous way where they have, you know, different uh, machines or different cores running trying different values of alpha and then stopping after a while and figuring out who's doing best and then sort of proceeding with the best value. So there's, you can imagine a lot of sort of interesting uh, algorithms you could build on that. But, you know, in practice, the choice, the way you choose alpha is a little bit fuzzy. All right, mirror descent. I promised I'd tell you about the uh, connection of all this to the mirror descent approach. Okay, now remember how I defined xk plus one. I defined it to be xk minus alpha k times this, this gradient. An equivalent way to say this, and not a very intuitive way, but an equivalent way to say that is, to, is that xk plus 1 is the minimizer of this quadratic. Okay, 
pretty obvious. If you take the minimum of this with respect to z, set it to zero, you just get the same formula I got earlier. So why do I write it in this sort of perverse way? Well, one reason is that if I write it in this way, I can easily extend this whole idea of stochastic gradient to the case where I've got a constraint, where I want x to belong to some set, closed convex set omega, okay? If I've got a, a constraint set, I can simply add it into this subproblem. I can just replace the argument over z with the argument of, over z belonging to omega. And I've got a perfectly valid constrained stochastic gradient uh, algorithm, okay? Um, the other point to make is here, you know, what's the function of this term? I mean, basically what we're doing here is kind of encouraging z to be in the negative gradient direction. The function of this term is kind of to restrict how far we move in that direction. The, so this sort of plays the role of a prox term or a damping term. The bigger we make, the smaller we make alpha, the bigger the penalty we're putting on how far we move away from xk, right? This sort of penalizes you for moving too far from xk. So cranking down alpha means that we've got a bigger penalty on a deviation from xk, which means we're taking a shorter step. But the other point of writing it in this way is that uh, you can actually use a different measure of distance from xk from what I've got here. This is sort of the obvious way to measure how far we move from xk, but we can actually consider using different uh, functions for measuring that distance. Okay. Now, it turns out that one, there's one very nice way to measure that distance that sort of fits very well with a, with a particular interesting choice of omega. Okay, so I guess I'm jumping ahead a couple of slides, but one choice of omega that we're interested in is, is, uh, uh, is the simplex, okay, where omega is the set of all x's whose components are positive and who add up to 1, okay? So the set of all x's with positive components to, that add up to 1. Does that remind you of sort of an interesting distribution which might be interesting in machine learning? Uh, probability distribution, right? It's like a discretization of a probability distribution. So very often, uh, you know, a lot of problems of interest are trying to minimize over sets of that nature, okay? So it turns out that you can define um, a, a prox measure, a measure of distance that's particularly well suited to that particular choice of omega. And it, it happens to be uh, well, let me sort of derive it in general terms and then show you what the specific choice is. So this is sort of the general way of defining the so-called Bregman distance function. So I've replaced that quadratic prox measure with this so-called Bregman divergence. What are the properties? How do you in general define this measure V, this measure of, of uh, Bregman distance? Well, you define it via this other function omega, which is a, we call a distance generating function, and you need omega to be strongly convex over this set, over this set uh, big omega. So little omega is very, very much tied to the choice of big omega. It doesn't have to be generally strongly convex, but it has to be strongly convex for all x and z in this set. Okay. So given that you've got this nice smooth function which, with this strong convexity property, you can then define v in this way. You can define it, you know, d derive it from, from omega. And you can use that v in place of the quadratic uh, divergence in the definition of uh, the stochastic gradient step. So what v is basically, it's, the, it's the, um, the divergence of little omega from being linear, okay? So it's like you take the linear estimate of little omega and you look how different that is from the true change in little omega as you go from x to z. So this picture shows that how v is defined. This is x, this is z. This is sort of the linear version of omega. This is the true omega. The difference between the two is your divergence, the Bregman divergence. Okay. So this is the set I just told you about, the simplex, right? The discretization of the, uh, of the space of distributions. All right. So if you choose little omega to be this function, the entropy function, and you figure out from that using the definition of V what V is, you get the callback Leibler divergence function which has come up in a number of other talks already. So you can use this definition of V. This uh, turns out to be, uh, when you plug that into this definition here, when you use a callback Leibler divergence here, in this formula, you end up with mirror descent, okay? So that's exactly mirror descent. So mirror descent is in a sense a sort of extension of, uh, of stochastic gradient to this uh, particular constraint set. And it's quite a popular method. So these techniques, it turns out, you know, the history of, 
of, um, uh, of stochastic gradient methods in machine learning is very interesting because it sort of paralleled the, the development of, uh, of st uh, stochastic gradient methods in optimization with not much crossover. So Jan LeCun tells me that you know, the idea goes back to the 80s even. Uh, certainly Leon Botu has been working on it since you know, he put out a code I think in 2004 and he continues to work on it and he's got a website where he has you know, his latest stuff. This is quite influential code Pegasus of uh, Shalev Schwartz and Srebro from 2007 uh, that they've again enhanced a little bit since then, but it's exactly this, this sort of method. And they sort of developed it independently of, uh, of what the people in optimization were doing. There's a nice tutorial by Nati and, and Ambush Tiwari from 2010. Uh, I think it was at ICML. They gave a tutorial where they focused a lot on, on SGD. And then there's this convex programming idea due to Zinkovich, again, a very well-known paper. It's a somewhat different model. So he's not assuming that uh, you're choosing indices at random. He's assuming that the indices are being thrown at you in a possibly adversarial way. So the nature of the analysis is quite different. He's not analyzing the rate of convergence of, an, of uh, the expected value function. He's analyzing the, the so-called regret function, uh, which is basically... Uh, how different your solution is from what you would get if you'd known everything that's been revealed in advance. Okay, so it's, a, it's analysis of a different nature, but it's not totally unrelated because he gets similar sorts of convergence rates to that robust algorithm that I showed you earlier. So I thought I'd mention that as a sort of related approach. Okay, I'll just say a little bit about what we've done, uh, something we did a couple of years ago with parallel stochastic gradient, and other people are interested in this as well. So if you're trying to run this approach on multiple processes, there's a bunch of things you can do. One of them is to sort of do it in a sort of a mini batch fashion, where you have different processes picking their own value of i, evaluating grad fi's in parallel, doing some kind of a sum to get a sort of a mini batch sum, and then stepping in that direction using a stochastic gradient type step. So these guys did that, okay? There's a round robin approach where you can have different cores, you can have x stored centrally, on a multi-core machine, you can have different cores taking turns at updating X. So each core gets assigned one of the grad FIs, one of the indices I, it evaluates uh, grad FI. When its turn comes around, it updates X, it locks X and ups updates it. So we tried something at, at Madison a couple of years ago, w which my colleague Chris Ray likes to give algorithms crazy names, so he called it Hogwild for reasons that I don't fully understand. But, but um, I think it's because it's sort of, it's sort of very gung-ho. It doesn't try to do anything subtle. And uh, again, it works for this multi-core environment where the X is stored centrally. But what's the process that's running on each core is just basically a, you know, a standard stochastic gradient step. It picks, each core picks its own index, it evaluates its own gradient, and then it goes and updates X. And it doesn't care what the other processes are doing. It doesn't, it doesn't lock X, it just does this as an atomic operation. It doesn't, um, uh, you know, it doesn't try to coordinate at all with other processes. It's completely asynchronous, okay? So is it possible to say anything about this approach? Well, of course, there's a risk with this approach that in the time between when you read X, while you're doing your evaluation, the X might have been updated by other cores, okay? So by the time you, you come to update X, the gradient information that you're using may now be out of date, okay, because X has changed since you evaluated the gradient. But we assume there's some sort of bound on how old it is, all right? So we assume that there's this bound tau so that you're no more than tau cycles late by the time you do the update. The, also, the other thing that we use is that in me very many applications, the grad FIs are often quite sparse. So for example, if each FI is a loss function depending on a particular item of data, often, um, uh, the gradient only depends on a few of the features, okay, so that, so that the FIs are often very sparse. And this means that there's not too much interference going on because the, the, uh, the elements of X that you're going to be updating are just a few of the elements of X, and it's sort of unlikely that too many other processes have messed with those elements in the time between when you read them and when you come to write. So we, use, we, we really use that in the analysis and we sort of quantify the amount of overlap between the support, the components that Fi and Fj depend on, where i and j are two indices. And we use this quantity rho, which sort of quantifies the average overlap between different uh, sub-functions. So if rho is close to zero, 
then that means that the FIs are generally uh, only depend on a few components of X and they don't overlap too much. If rho is close to one, then you've got a lot of overlap and you don't expect uh, to have very good convergence properties. So I won't try to work through any sort of details at all, uh, but we did some analysis and it was simplified recently by our colleague Peter Richterich. Um, and we basically showed it had the flavor of that third variant of stochastic gradient. Well, we tried to figure out how many steps do we need to take to get the error in F below some threshold epsilon in expectation. And so we, we showed that if you made this constant choice of step length and took this many iterations, then you, know, you were able to get below the threshold in expectation. So there are a whole lot of constants floating around in here. There are things like M, which is the bound on the gradient. L is the Lipschitz constant of F. Tau is the bound on how old the update can be. Rho is that thing that quantifies overlap. A whole lot of sort of messy stuff goes in here. But basically, you see sort of a 1 over k behavior. So, I mean, in, in order to get the error below epsilon, the number of steps we have to take is sort of order 1 over epsilon. So that's sort of typical of a 1 over k convergence rate. So we basically were able to recover the same sort of rate that you see in regular S, uh, SGD. So we didn't pay too much of a price for having this sort of parallelism going on, provided the delay is not too bad, okay? As the delay degrades, then obviously the number of iterations you, uh, you need to take is going to go up linearly in tau. Okay. But the bottom line is you can, provided there's not too much overlap, you can parallelize this pretty well. And our experience seemed to bear that out. We did some comparisons with these, the two other approaches that I told you about, the, ones that, the one that averages and the ones that take turns. And in a particular regime, this is on an SVM, this is on a, a matrix completion problem, this is on a graph cuts problem that up, up to 10 cores were able to get speed ups of up to you know, five, six, sometimes eight. I should say that the, the sorts of problems that this approach does well on are problems where evaluations of the gradients are extremely cheap, okay? So evaluations of the grad FI is very cheap. And that's true of a, quite a lot of learning problems. On problems where the grad FIs are expensive, these other approaches are perfectly competitive, particularly the, um, uh, the, the, round, uh, the round robin approach. Oh, no, actually the AIG approach is pretty competitive in that situation. And this one also, the round robin, it looks terrible here, but th there are also regimes where it does quite well. Okay, there's, some, there's a table there. All right, so any questions about stochastic gradient? Again, there's much more to say about that area, but I've sort of shown you some, some of the basics. And I, I wanted to give you some of the complete convergence proofs just to prove to you that it's really not very scary. You know, you can really do it in a few pages using very elementary analysis tools. Okay? Yes? Maybe question to the last convergence proof. So you ended up with um, one over square root of k, right? Well, w oh, the last one back here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm not very much into these proofs. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, but it's a weak bound, possibly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's um, it's doubtful that you can do much better, I would say. Uh, you probably have to make additional assumptions on the function to really do much better. And it's it's also likely that someone clever could devise a function that sort of, you know, proves that this is tight. But can one also prove uh, that it's high or something? You probably can. I, I haven't tried to do that, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if you could construct a function where it really does take something like this. Okay. All right, so let me move on to another area, which is probably, which may be a little bit controversial in the um, context of machine learning because people have really moved away from using higher order methods, I would say, for many years. Um, uh, the emphasis uh, in, in algorithms and optimization algorithms in machine learning was really on first order methods that just used gradient information. But there's been a little bit of a trend back recently towards you know, maybe considering using methods that try to use higher order information, either explicitly from calculating second derivatives or approximating second derivatives, or maybe from using gradient information to come up with partial approximations to second derivatives. And there have been some contexts where this seems to be a promising thing to do. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on, on higher order methods, just to sort of lodge it in your mind in case you come across a problem at some point in your career where it may be useful, okay? Again, this is going to be inevitably very, uh, you know, very quick introduction. Uh, okay, so what's the idea of higher order methods? Well, the idea is that instead of just going out to one term in the Taylor series, 
you actually go out two terms. So you approximate, if you're at some point x, and you want to figure out what f is doing at x plus d, where d is a short step away from x, Taylor series tells you that f of x plus d is approximately equal to this quadratic in, in d. And so we actually, you know, do something with this term, approximate this term somehow. So what can we do? So if you're close to a solution, again, I'm going to be mostly talking about convex functions here, but everything I say can sort of be generalized, although it's a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with non-convex. Um, uh, so in the convex case, this matrix is positive definite, or at least positive semi-definite, this Hessian matrix of second derivatives. If it is positive definite, then you can actually figure out the D that minimizes this approximation explicitly. You can just take the derivative of this with respect to D and set it to zero, and you end up with this formula here. So this is the classical Newton step. Okay, very important object in optimization. Okay, now often it's hard to compute this or it's not even necessary to compute this explicitly. So you do things with a Hessian. You might approximate it by doing uh, maybe sampling. There might be some cheap way you can get a sort of estimate of this matrix. Um, you might be able to reuse it at some nearby point. You might not want to evaluate the Hessian at every iterate, but you might want to use the same Hessian for a few iterates in a row. That works. You can approximate it by doing some finite differencing. Um, you can approximate it also, and I'll just say a little bit about this, by looking at the difference between successive pairs of gradients, right? Because I think I told you yesterday that if you look at the difference between two gradients, that tells you something about what the Hessian has done over the step that you've just taken. So you can use that information. Or you can calculate it exactly, and sometimes it's worth doing that. Okay. So what about this, you know, you might ask the question, you know, can this ever be practical? Because this is, if n is large, this is going to be a really big matrix, right? Huge. Uh, sometimes even in the context of like deep learning applications, it's actually also, you know, dense. So, um, you know, it's very difficult even to store it and, and maybe to calculate it. On the other hand, in a lot of learning applications, it's, it's composed often of simple functions. So you can actually write down on a piece of paper what the second derivatives are. It just might be really expensive to compute them. In some instances, it might also be sparse, okay? Uh, so maybe it would be possible in principle to, to compute and store it. Um, also, you know, you can only do this when f is smooth. And as you know, in a lot of uh, applications, you're dealing with uh, functions with non-smoothness. But very often in learning, the non-smoothness enters in a, high, in a very structured way so that you can sort of deal with the non-smoothness in some explicit, you know, tailored way that still allows you to make use of higher order information. And the other point is that, I've, as I've already said, um, you may not need to use to compute these derivatives. You can approximate them in some way. I just want to make the point here, and unfortunately I won't have time to really say too much more about this, but very often in learning you're sort of working, you're doing optimization in a very high dimensional space. But the whole purpose of doing the you know, learning and the data analysis is that the interesting stuff is often happening on a very low dimensional sub-manifold. Okay? So one strategy, if you want to use higher order information, is not to use higher order information on an entire space, but sort of to home in on the subspace where you think the solution lies or where the interesting stuff is happening. And just use higher order information just on that subspace. Okay? So you could conceive of a strategy where you sort of might use a first order method or a stochastic gradient method to identify which part of the big space is really interesting and then switch to a different algorithm which sort of maybe uses second order information on the subspace. So some people, including me, have worked on methods like that. Okay, so how do you implement Newton's method? So I wrote down earlier what the explicit formula for D was, provided that this Hessian is non-singular, you can just explicitly invert it. But really what you're doing is solving a linear system where the Hessian is, is the coefficient matrix, the D is the unknown, and the right-hand side is a negative gradient. So the way Newton's method is often implemented is you do some factorization of the Hessian, like into triangular factors, LL transpose, Cholesky factorization, and then you do back substitution to get the solution. Okay, So that's the, the sort of crude way or the, the standard way of implementing Newton's method. The important property from an analytical point of view is if you do have an exact Hessian, you get this quadratic convergence. And as I said yesterday, this, this sort of convergence is really, really fast. It's really as fast as you'd ever want to go. Okay? It only holds locally, of course. You have to be within a neighborhood of the solution to see this rapid convergence happening. 
But basically what it means is once you get into such a neighborhood, within about two or three steps you're done. You know, you've converged to a very high accuracy. Now what do you do when this matrix is not positive definite? Well then there are tricks you can do, like you can add something to the diagonal and you get so-called levenberg marquardt or Damp-Newton method. So you make, you boost the diagonal by a big enough quantity to make this matrix non-singular. And you can show that if, provided you sort of phase out the damping when you get close to the solution, you can still get fast convergence, okay? I, I'll just point out here that this is related to steepest descent. In steepest descent, if we just approximate the Hessian by zero and replace delta by one over alpha, we've just got the steepest descent step. So you can think of it as kind of a, a very you know, rough special case of Newton in a sense. It fits in the same framework. The other point is that you don't have to solve these equations exactly. And so there are a lot of contexts, not in learning, but certainly in like discretized PDEs and so on, in scientific computing, where people do Newton's method, but they solve these equations using some iterative method like conjugate gradient. And in conjugate gradient, what you have to do is not factor this matrix, but just do repeated matrix vector multiplications with the Hessian. So they repeatedly have to do operations where they take the Hessian and multiply it by some vector u, okay? Now you can do this without even knowing the Hessian, right? Because you can approximate this matrix vector multiply by a finite difference. So again, I can use Taylor series to say that this matrix times u is approximately what you get by taking the difference of two gradients at two nearby points, x plus epsilon u and x, take the difference of those two and divide by epsilon, and you get basically this, okay, to within an order epsilon approximation. So you never actually need to evaluate the Hessian order in order to solve these equations by an iterative method. You just have to evaluate the gradient a lot, okay? As many times as, it, as, uh, as, many times as, as iterations you're doing on this. So there are inexact Newton's method that do maybe 10 iterations, so you have to evaluate 10 gradients, and they get a you know, reasonably good approximation to D, and they can go on step using that. Okay, so I don't think this is done that much in learning, but certainly it's done a lot in other areas of scientific computing. I mentioned the idea of sampling, so let me go back to this function that we were considering when we were doing stochastic gradient, where F is the sum of FIs. So this is something that some colleagues of mine have done recently, and it's a very sensible idea. If M is huge, then evaluating the exact gradient obviously involves evaluating all the partial gradients and summing them up. But you can imagine a sensible strategy is just to take a small subset of all those uh, indices and to approximate the, gradi uh, approximate the Hessian with just a sum over that subset. So B might have only maybe 1% or 2% of the elements of, uh, of M. Okay? It might be only 0 .1, 0 0.01 times M. And often that's a good enough application. So this is being done in deep learning and speech applications uh, by some of my colleagues including people in the community. And they get a good enough approximation to the Hessian to be able to take a, a reasonable approximation to the Newton step. Okay, so that's one thing you can consider. Here's another thing, and this is again a classical technique in optimization going back to 1970 or so. So the idea is that here, instead of using the true Hessian, you use some approximation. This should be a B, sorry. I changed the notation at like one o'clock this morning, so I'm sorry I didn't quite catch it all. But instead of uh, the true Hessian, you use some matrix B, where B sort of approximates the behavior of the true Hessian, okay? How does it approximate the behavior? Well, as I just told you a moment ago, if you look at the last step that you took, and you look at the difference of the last two gradients, then Taylor's theorem tells you that if you take the true Hessian multiplied by this step, you should recover the difference of the gradients approximately, okay? Again, this is just calculus maybe second semester calculus, Taylor's theorem. So you want to define your approximate Hessian BK to have the same property that the Hessian does. So you want your BK to satisfy exactly this inequality. So then it will at least, at least share some properties with the true Hessian. You also, so at each iteration you want to change BK to BK plus one so that it satisfies this new property. You want to make the smallest change possible because you've been updating B at every iteration you don't want to change it by more than is necessary to satisfy this latest equation. So again, this is kind of Occam's razor. You just want to do enough just to satisfy this property, but no more, okay? 
And you also might want to do things like maintain positive definiteness of BK because then you're guaranteed that this solution will, this system will have a solution. So it so happens you can satisfy all of these properties very neatly with an explicit update formula. And this is one such formula that was derived by four people independently. This is Broyden, Fletcher, Goldfarb and Shano. And they wrote four papers. They all appeared in the year 1970 and they all came up with the same formula, okay? And this is it. Um, and uh, it's a very simple rank two update to BK. It tells you how to get from BK to BK plus one. You just plug in the latest step, the latest change in the gradient, and you get this formula, okay? And it has all those properties that I mentioned earlier. So you have to start from something. So you usually pick the start at the very first iteration. You just use some multiple of the identity as the starting matrix. There are a lot of variants on this, okay? So one such variant is instead of updating the true Hessian or an approximation to the true Hessian, instead you maintain an approximation to the inverse of the Hessian, okay? And why would you want to do that? Well, it makes the step calculation easier. Instead of having to solve a linear system to get the step, you just have to do a matrix vector multiply with the, the Hessian inverse approximation times the gradient, okay? And so there are variants of these quasi-Newton methods that update an inverse Hessian approximation instead, okay? What is the general uh, property? Well, the, the sort of canonical property of quasi-Newton is that you don't get quadratic convergence like you get with the true Newton method, but you do get superlinear local convergence. So that's still a great property. That's fast, right? Faster than linear. It means the new error is much better than the old error, asymptotically, at every iteration. So, you know, at the cost of just one gradient evaluation per iteration, um, you know, really no more work than you're doing in uh, just a straight gradient method, you're able to get not linear convergence, but superlinear convergence. So these things are definitely worth considering, okay? The drawback, as I've stated here, is that if you're dealing with a problem in a huge dimensional space, this is a big n by n matrix, right? So to store this matrix is a humongous amount of storage, potentially. So that's the price you pay. And also the work per iteration, if you have to do a matrix vector multiply with this matrix, that's an order n squared operation. So that might be more work than you're willing to do, okay? However, as I said, if you're just doing this on a low dimensional submanifold, maybe it'll be practical. But here's another way to make it practical. And this is a really clever idea, I think. So I have another 30 minutes or so, right? Okay. So this is a, a very clever idea that my colleague uh, Jorge Nosadal came up with about 25 years ago. So he noticed that there's really no need to store this, these full matrices, HK or BK or, wh or whatever you're dealing with. Because each of, these full, each of these matrices is just constructed from some initial guess plus a bunch of rank two updates. So if you keep track of all the S's and the Y's that you've encountered so far, these are all just vectors of length N, if you keep track of all of them, you could reconstruct this matrix on the fly, okay, just from knowledge of all the, the previous S's and Y's. So the, the trick here is that you don't store all the S's and Y's, you just store the most recent ones. You store maybe the last M S's and Y's, right? And then you reconstruct B, K on the fly by taking some initial guess, multiple of the identity, and then applying the last M updates to that, to that uh, initial guess. Okay, and you can do all of this implicitly. You never need to actually form BK. You can just form, you can do a matrix vector multiply with BK or with, you know, HK or whatever you're working with implicitly. You can write a little piece of code, there's sort of two loops of length M uh, that basically do order MN operations uh, and they basically compute the, the search direction corresponding to this approximate quasi-Newton Hessian. Okay. So, terrific idea. Uh, the amount of storage, you only need enough storage to store two M of these vectors. So if M is like five, typically M is like five, maybe 10, people use sometimes. This is like 20, M stor 20 N storage, so it's not too bad. Uh, it's, you know, the amount of arithmetic is not that much more than uh, steepest descent. And it's potentially um, a lot faster. It's not super linear, okay? I don't think anyone's proved anything very interesting about convergence rates for this thing, but the behavior is good in general, okay? Often better than a nonlinear conjugate gradient approach. 
Okay, so this has turned out to be a very, very popular idea across a whole wide range of applications. All right, so any questions on that? So that's sort of higher order methods, lightning tour, higher order methods for minimization. And hopefully planted the seeds of some ideas that might be interesting at some point in your career. Yes? So using the hash and um, in what situation can it go wrong? I mean, let's say your function is not convex. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can get situations where it will converge to a saddle point. Uh, but uh, so you have to, you can add safeguards to that. You can use trust regions and so on. But it's, it's something you have to be aware of, I would say. Now, you can usually detect if you're at a saddle point, you know, the Hessian is going to have some negative eigenvalues. And, and you can, you know, often you find some strategy to move away. So one, one uh, strategy is that you actually move in the direction of an eigenvector that's corresponding to a negative eigenvalue. So that's sort of kicking you off the saddle point in a downhill direction. So there, yes, there are enhancements that you have to apply to make sure that those nasty things don't happen, for sure, in a practical method. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Excellent question. Uh, it seems that, again, people just do it by experimentation, right? Uh, and I've heard values of M all the way from 3 up to, I think, 25 is the largest one I've heard of. In data assimilation, uh, colleagues that are doing uh, weather forecasting and data assimilation often like to take M up to 25, 20 or so. Um, but it seems that, you know, 5 is often a good thing to start with, maybe 10, you know. Um, you know, it's, they seem to be universal constants. You don't seem to gain too much if you go beyond that. All right. Um, th there's a chapter in the in my book with uh, Nosadal where we have a you know pseudo code to implement it. Incredibly simple to implement. You know, the only tricky part is that you just t is the, is managing the storage for storing the the s's and the y's, and you can you know. I'm sure you're all accomplished programmers and that's, this is not like rocket science. Um, so you can implement this, I'm sure, in a page of MATLAB and it'll work reasonably well. The only tricky part is the line search because all of these methods, Newton and quasi-Newton, once you've decided on the search direction, you have to do some sort of line search. And depending on how fancy you want to get with that, uh, that's often where the complicated part of the code is. Okay? Any more questions? All right. So... While we're on the subject of higher order methods, I wanted to say a little bit about um, interior point methods because this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And it turns out that, uh, you know, it's one of the first things I tried when I started, when I learned about SVM, for example, and other sorts of learning problems. Back in the late 90s, this was. And recently, it's cropped up again as a way of doing uh, problems in compressed sensing. And it may not be so bad in that. Uh, in that situation as people originally thought. Uh, so uh, let me give you the basic idea of S, and it's also, yeah, I should also say it's very useful in control applications. So a lot of, certainly industrial process control, this is a very popular approach. They get very highly structured quadratic programs that crop up in that setting. Even in um, higher frequency control in electronics, and I believe in, in even in robotics, I was talking to, to Stefan Schall yesterday, and he uh, he said that a lot of their problems are convex QPs. So um, I think it's worth knowing about, okay? All right, so this is the setting. We're talking about a convex objective where Q is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. So Q is allowed to be zero. If Q is zero, then this is just linear programming. We've got linear constraints and we've got non-negativity on the Xs, right? So elementary uh, Convert, uh, elementary uh, optima optimality theory and optimization says that you can recognize when you're at a solution of this problem by the existence of a vector lambda, which is so-called Lagrange multipliers, and another vector s that satisfies these properties. So that if there exists a lambda and an s such that qx minus plus c minus a transpose lambda minus s equals zero, ax equals b, X and S are non-negative. X has to be non-negative, of course. The constraints have to be satisfied. That's where that comes from. And then there's this complementary property that each element of X times the corresponding element of S has to be equal to zero, okay? 
So if you can find a lambda and an S such that all of these properties are satisfied, then X is a solution of this problem. And so solving this problem becomes a matter of searching for X and lambda and S that satisfies all these conditions. Okay? And I'm going to skip over why that's true, but some of you know about duality and you know this is kind of halfway on the way to duality. So all right, so another way to write these conditions is to take the components of X and S, which are both vectors of length n, and build them up into diagonal matrices. So just take X, put it along the diagonal of a matrix, make everything else of the matrix zero. Okay, and you can and you can define a big a matrix big X that way. You can define a matrix big S the same way. You can define a, a vector E, which is just the vector of all ones. Okay, and if you define with these three definitions, you can write this last condition as simply big X times big S times E is equal to zero. Big X times big S times E is just a vector whose components are XI, SI. Okay? So I've written this last condition in sort of this weird way. But if I do that, then those optimality conditions are then a simply a system of nonlinear equations. All right? Here was the first one, qx plus c minus a transpose lambda minus s equals zero. Here's the second one, ax equals b. Here's the third one, big X times big S times E equals zero. This is a square system of nonlinear equations. The number of unknowns in the system, are, there are n of them here. There are m of them here, where m is the number of rows in A. And there are n here. So there are two n plus m unknowns. And if you count up the number of equations, there's two n plus m equations. Okay. So this is a square system. Number of equations equals number of unknowns. The tricky part is we've still got some inequalities to satisfy. So it's a constrained system of nonlinear equations. Okay? But we can use Newton's, we can apply Newton's method to that system. And there was a slide that I skipped over here, which I should go back to. I've been talking mostly about Newton's method for minimizing F, but you can also use Newton's method to solve a system of nonlinear equations. <coughs> If you've got a nonlinear equation system, big F, mapping Rn to Rn, you can form a Taylor series approximation to big F of x plus d. And if you go out to first order, you've got big F of x plus d is equal to f of x plus a Jacobian of x. Jacobian is a matrix of first partial derivative. It's an n by n matrix times d. Uh, and that gives you a you know first order approximation to, to this. And so you can get a Newton step by just dropping the residual term and choosing dk to make the first order approximation equal to zero. That gives you a Newton step dk. And you can prove that that converges quadratically. And the theory is very much the same as the theory for minimization. It's just a slightly different setting. All right. So this is, what, this is the method that we're going to use to solve this problem. We're just going to apply Newton's method to this system. Okay. We're going to change it a little bit. I'm going to cheat a little bit by perturbing the right-hand side of Newton's method. Instead of using F itself, we're going, to use, we're going to perturb the last equation a little bit. The other thing we have to be careful of is we want to stay interior. The reason these are called interior point methods is that all the iterates that they generate satisfy this inequality strictly. Okay? So we're going to make sure that at every iteration, X is strictly positive, S is strictly positive. So we're going to curtail a step. We're going to choose a step like to make sure that that's always true. So this is it for interior point methods. They're basically Newton steps on a slightly perturbed version of this system that take step lengths that maintain strict positivity of the x's and s's. That's almost all you need to know. Okay? These are some details. So this is the Newton system. This is the Jacobian of that system I just showed you. You can easily compute that. This is just F itself. There's a little, this is the perturbation that I promised you. You take uh, the vector E, you multiply it by some scalar between 0 and 1. You also multiply it by the so-called duality gap, which is just X transpose S over N. And I won't talk too much about that. But apart from this, this is, you know, if you leave this term out, you've just basically got the Newton system. And the theory for this is very beautiful. Again, it's quite elementary. You can prove it you know, by using the most basic tools imaginable in math. Um, and I have a book uh, about this in 1997, uh, which is, you know, has the self-contained theory for these methods. They're very, very easy to implement. Uh, there's a lot of structure in the system, typically, because in many applications, Q is block diagonal. 
A is often block diagonal or has, has some other exploitable structure. So you can solve this, this system usually very efficiently in a way that's customized to the application. You can, again, you can write down codes that are maybe two or three pages of MATLAB that implement this that with, you know, remarkable efficiency. Okay, so these were tried. As I mentioned, when, when uh, people wrote down, you know, the kernel form, the dual form of SVM, this was one of the first things they tried. So there's a paper by Fine and Scheinberg from 2001, and my colleagues Ferris and Munson wrote a, another paper about the same time where they just did interior point methods uh, on dual SVM with some success, but of course uh, they had to do you know, things that took account of the structure to make it work reasonably well. In the domain of compressed sensing, which I'll say a little bit more about if I've got time, uh, the first thing that people tried in compressed sensing when it burst onto the scene in 2005 were um, interior point methods. So if you look at the early codes L1 magic of Candace and Romberg, this was the first thing they tried. Now they were quickly superseded with first order methods, okay? But it turns out recently that, you know, they've been reconsidered in this setting. And some of my colleagues have had some success with, with doing interior point methods for compressed sensing. So let me just say a little bit about that. I don't have that much time to spend on this, this part of it. But this, you might recognize this as the lasso problem, okay? Uh, Tib Sharani's lasso. If you've got a linear least squares problem, you can add on a multiple of the uh, one norm of x and choose the regularization parameter tau, and this will tend to select certain variables, okay? Select some subset of the components of x. You can write this as a quadratic program by taking x and splitting it into positive and negative parts. This is a standard trick in optimization. And if you do that, if you express x as u minus v, where u and v are both non-negative vectors, then you can write the one norm as the sum of elements of u plus v, okay? And you can get it completely equivalent. Uh, you, can go, you can go from having a problem that's uh, least squares plus L1 to a problem that's quadratic with bounds, okay? And it's totally equivalent. And so what you can do then is, uh, uh, is apply uh, interior point methods to this formulation. Okay, and so that's what my colleagues at Edinburgh have done. And they've made use of the fact that when you go through the process of writing down that system of equations in interior point methods, exploiting the, the structure and the constraints, there's essentially no constraints except the bounds, you can sort of manipulate that big uh, matrix and get it down to a more compact form. And then you can use the fact that this matrix B, this coefficient matrix in the least squares, as we'll mention later, when you're dealing with compressed sensing, this matrix B has some very special properties. And they are that, there's the so-called RIP or incoherence properties, which make, you, uh, which make it possible to come up with nice preconditioners for this system. So you can approximate the B transpose B terms with multiples of the identity and not lose too much. So they do all of that. They then apply an iterative method to solve that interior point system. And they're able to show that you get, uh, by using that preconditioner, they get very good performance. They, they show that... As you get closer to the solution, they take about 20 CG, uh, 20 interior point iterations. You notice if you implement interior point, you always seem to need somewhere between 10 and 50 iterations to solve almost any problem. That's sort of a you know, remarkably constant property. And so they show that if you do this, if you exploit the structure in the problem, the conditioning of the linear system that you have to solve actually gets better as you get closer to a solution. And that's a contrast with the classical implementation of interior point where if you don't precondition, it gets worse and worse, okay? So they show that by exploiting the properties of the problem, they actually get better conditioning and they get competitive conf uh, performance with first order methods. All right, I'm sorry that was a very rushed introduction to interior point, but at least I guess I can recommend that you go look at my book if you're interested. I can point you to some other papers. Um, which talk more about applications to these structured situations uh, if you want to pursue that as well. So are there any questions before we leave that, that area? Okay. So before the break, I think I'll have a sip of water before I keep going, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, regularization and how you modify optimization algorithms to do that. Now,
Zubin has given you a very different perspective on this, and I sort of get the idea that regularization is kind of a, a, you know, a pejorative term in the, the way he describes things. So I'm going to give you my uh, extremely naive, uh, possibly um, politically incorrect uh, uh, motivation for, for writing down regularized problems. And, but I don't think it's inconsistent with what Zubin says, because I think a lot of, you know, when you boil down a lot of his problems, uh, in, as optimization problems, if you choose to solve them as optimization problems, they really have the same structure that I'm going to talk about. They often have some sort of loss function plus some sort of, well, call it a regularizer if you want, but some sort of, you know, possibly non-smooth term added on, okay? And so I think some of the algorithms that I talk about are still going to be relevant no matter how you go about constructing the objective in the first place. But... Um, I guess these are slides that I didn't prepare, these next three, but I still take responsibility for them. If I'm going to show them to you, I, I have to take responsibility. But I just want to sort of motivate inference by saying that very often the situation that you're in is you've got some sort of observed data. So you might have a bunch of feature vectors and a bunch of outcomes, classes or, or some sort of outcome. And I'm going to call those Y. Y is the data, okay? Then the stuff that you're trying to estimate. So this could be, you know, hidden variables. It could be some sort of signal and compressed sensing. It could be an image that you're trying to recover from a noisy version of the image. It could be a vector or a matrix if you're doing matrix completion. But essentially what you're trying to do is construct an objective so that when you plug the, the observed data into that objective, you can recover the thing that you want to recover by minimizing this function g. Okay? So the game becomes... Uh, constructing the G in such a way that the inference has the desired properties. Okay, so you have to know how to construct the G. Very often the G has this form that I mentioned. It's some sort of, you know, loss plus some sort of additional information, okay, which could be, could come from a prior or it could come from known structure of X that you're trying to impose on X. So very often the H captures how well X and Y are consistent, the consistency, the match between X and Y could be a least squares term, uh, could be a log likelihood function, some other kind of loss function. And the, the, the psi calculates, well, I, I'm going to call it a regularizer. It, 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 it introduces some sort of prior knowledge about the structure or some prior knowledge about x. And then tau is this sort of scalar regularization parameter that sort of weights off the importance of doing the fitting to how strongly you feel about the, st about the structure you're trying to impose. So large values of tau typically sort of place more emphasis on, on fitting a prior or on imposing the structure. Okay? So th this is going to be the form that I consider in this part of the talk. I'm going to take f to be usually some smooth, but, you know, at least some nice sort of function, and psi to be something that's typically, uh, you know, convex, but possibly, in fact, usually non-smooth, Okay? but in some sense easy, some, easy to deal with in some way. So common regularizers, you know, the, the game becomes, for the sort of structure you're looking for in X, the game becomes how do you choose a regularizer which achieves that property that you're looking for? And that's actually, you know, a bit of a black art. You can make it rigorous by, you know, using the sort of motivation that's been discussed in the earlier talks, but in some sense it's still, I, I would say, still not a, a completely well-defined area. So the sorts of structures you might be looking for in compressed sensing, you're often looking for sparsity. Uh, if you're doing regularization, you're often looking for, to decrease the norm of X to make sure it's not too big. You might be looking for specific non-zero patterns. You might not just be interested in getting a sparse X with few non-zeros, but, but you want the, those non-zeros to be arranged in a particular way. And I'll just say a little bit about that. If X is a matrix, which it can be, you might be looking for a low rank matrix. Again, an instance of Occam's razor. You might be looking for a matrix that, you know, has small rank but nevertheless fits the data that you've observed. Okay, so this is one way to formulate the problem, to trade off between some loss and some regularizer. But there are actually uh, two other ways, equivalent ways, to formulate the problem. And Mario came up with these terms. So this is what he calls the Tikhonov. I think this is a fairly well-defined term. But he dug into the literature and found that, you know, came up with the name Morozov and Ivanov for these other formulations. So these are equivalent from an optimization viewpoint. And by equivalent, I mean 
that for certain choices of tau, epsilon, and delta, these three problems have the same solution. So in this problem, you're sort of, ex you're sort of uh, defining a threshold value for f, and you want to make sure that f is below that threshold. For all x satisfying this relationship, you want to minimize the regularizer. Uh, you could go the other way around. You could define an acceptable value for the regularizer, and you want to minimize f subject to all x satisfying that value. Okay? But all three of these, in a sense, are equivalent. So you can work on any one of them. In some settings, one of them is typically more convenient for the, than the other. One makes more sense than the other. Okay? So I usually like to work with this one, but you don't have to be dogmatic about it. For some reason, all these are Russians. I don't know why that is, but uh, maybe Russians are the, are the people that sort of were most keen on regularization initially. Okay. Uh, well, I want to make the point now that if you... I'm going to say quite a bit about sparsity because that's sort of been the hot topic in recent years where uh, partly as a result of compressed sensing, but it also came up in the lasso in 1997. And I'm sure it's been floating around in the statistics for a long time. So... If you're looking for a sparse solution of a least squares problem, what you'd really like to do is say to minimize the number of non-zeros in the vector subject to satisfying the least squares criterion to some level. So you'd like to minimize the cardinality, okay, number of non-zeros. That's a really hard problem, okay. Computationally, it's very hard. There's no efficient way to solve this. It's known. Even if you do it, if you formulate it in one of the other ways, where you put the, le the least squares in the objective and put a constraint on the cardinality, that's also hard. However, the, the sort of outstanding observation of compressed sensing, and of course predated by, by Tib Schrading's lasso, is that very often you can replace the cardinality with the one norm, and you can get the same answer, or at least answers that are sort of close. Okay, that's the outstanding observation. And the reason that's a really incredibly interesting observation is that if I put the one norm here, I've got a convex optimization problem. And you can solve convex optimization problems very efficiently. Certainly when they're quadratic like this, there are polynomial time algorithms. So you go from having a problem that's NP hard to having a problem that in some circumstances is actually equivalent that's convex, okay? So the formulation makes a world of difference in this, in this case. So this is a picture of compressed sensing, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this since I've got a little bit extra time. But in compressed sensing, uh, the idea is you've got some signal x that you're trying to estimate, and the data that you've got about x is a bunch of observations. Maybe you multiply x by some random matrix, and there may be some noise as well. Okay? So the y is the data, just like it was in my general inference problem earlier, and you're trying to recover x. Now, the trick in compressed sensing is that X lives in a high dimensional space. X has dimension N, okay? But you can, sometimes you can get X exactly by only knowing, a, by, by having a set of observations that's many fewer than N. So instead of having a thousand observations where a thousand is a dimension of N, you may only have a hundred, okay? So you might think, well, that makes this an incredibly underdetermined system. How can I possibly figure out what X is you know, X with a thousand elements, by only knowing a hundred pieces of information about it. Sounds impossible. It sounds completely ambiguous, right? There must be an entire manifold of X's that satisfy this relationship. Well, the, the thing that makes compressed sensing work, one of the things that makes compressed sensing work is that, first of all, you've got additional information about X. You know that X is sparse, okay? You know a priori that X only has, say, 10 non-zero elements or 20 non-zero elements. And that information makes a world of difference. Then by designing A appropriately, you can actually recover X exactly, okay, to within the noise, okay? If there's no noise, you can actually prove that you can get X precisely by solving this problem, this convex optimization problem, where you put the uh, two-norm criterion together with the one-norm, okay? And that's the outstanding observation of the initial papers in compressed sensing, Kanders, Romberg, and Tau. They're able to prove actual equivalence of the L1 formulation. So here's a picture where this is the true X. Notice it's only got a fairly small number of non-zeros. Uh, these are the observations, and this is the X that we recover by solving this problem. And notice that the non-zeros are almost in the same place, or they are in the same place. In some cases, the size of the spikes is a little bit different because there's a little bit of noise in the sample. But the locations are, the, are right, are correct. 
Okay, here are some pictures of compressed sensing. So here's a picture of what I just showed you. This is the vector we're trying to recover. These are the observations. This is the linear operator that maps from the vector space to the observation space. Okay? Now, this is the additional information we have. We know that the true vector is sparse. So these white spaces are the elements that we know to be, that, uh, you know, that are zero. We don't know where they are. Part of the game in compressed sensing is figuring out where the non-zeros are. Okay? Now, you need A to have certain properties. Okay? If all you know about a W is, it is that it contains five non-zeros, you're really looking for needles in a haystack, right? You don't know where these things are, and that's the game, is to figure out where they are. If you're doing something really naive by sort of looking at individual elements of, of X or W, then that's a hopeless strategy, right? Because you have to look at an awful lot of elements in order to five the fi find the five non-zeros. So the strategy in compressed sensing is you don't look at individual elements. Instead, what you do is take random combinations of all the elements, right? And you do that repeatedly. So each row of A corresponds to one sort of random combination of all the elements of, of, of X or W. And that's the secret. You don't look for needles in the haystack. You look across the whole haystack and you do that, look at it from a bunch of different angles. And what you end up with is enough information to, re is to be able to figure out where the non-zeros are. Okay. All right, so this is compressing. This is the property that you want the observation matrix to satisfy. Basically, if you know that, that uh, the true signal has k non-zeros, you need the observation matrix A to be such that all submatrices of A with k columns are almost orthonormal. That is, those, every set of k columns of A is almost ortho or an orthogonal set. And the good news is that that sounds like an incredibly strong property. The good news is that if you choose A to be a bunch of Gaussian random variables independently selected, it will have this property to very high probability. Okay? So random matrices work. You can also try to design them, but designing them is optimally is a very, very hard problem. Even checking that this property holds rigorously is very hard. But we know there are concentration results that, that tell you that they hold to high probability. Okay, so this is the problem that we want to solve. I'm not going to have time to work through this example, actually. But you can actually do very elementary analysis that proves that this strategy of replacing the cardinality with the one norm works. And I've got this example that runs over two slides that actually proves, uh, that shows why this works. And I think I'm going to have to skip it, unfortunately. But the critical, the critical observation that makes it work is that if I take the ratio of the one norm to the two norm of some random vector v, okay, all we know about that in general is that the ratio of the one norm to the two norm is somewhere between one and the square root of n. So those of you that have taken linear algebra classes know that if you're defining um, a vector v uh, with n elements, that the ratio of the one norm to the two norm is somewhere in this range. That's all you know, okay? But this is the thing that makes it work. If you, if you know that V is restricted to a random subspace, it's not allowed to range over the full space, but it's restricted to some uh, random subspace of some matrix A, then you can actually say much more about this ratio. What you can show is that this ratio tends to be close to its upper bound, not its lower bound. Okay? And this sequence of elementary inequalities here tells you why that's significant, and I'm not going to have time to cover that. But that's the property that's key. And uh, if that's true, if it's close to its upper bound, this thing all works. And I've got some pictures here that show, and I'm promising I'm not doctoring anything here, but what I've done here is to take a random matrix A, and I've taken all the vectors in the null space of A. So A is a 4 by 7 matrix. So the, space of the null space of A has dimension 3. So what I've plotted on this three-dimensional sphere are all the possible directions in the null space of A. And I've color-coded them according to whether this ratio of V1 over V2 is closer to the upper bound, in which case it's red, or the lower bound, in which case it's blue. And what this picture shows, this looks like, to me this looks like a picture of Mars. And I insist I only ran this once in MATLAB. And I got this picture and I've used it ever since. But you can see that it's almost always close to its upper bound. Okay? It's closer to the upper bound rather than the lower bound. There are some patches here where it's sort of in the middle, the green patches. So this is for a matrix that's 4 by 7. If I go to a higher dimensional space, 
17 by 20. Again, the, the, the subspace has dimension 3. You can see here that it's almost always near the upper bound. So this is the property that makes compressed sensing work, that makes the one norm work. Okay, so I think I better quit um, a little bit early. But after the break, I'm almost up to my quota of slides, so we're not doing too badly. So after the break, I'll say a little bit more about the one norm, and then I'll talk about uh, generalizations of the one norm to other kinds of regularizers. And then I'll talk about algorithms that we can use to solve these problems with regularizers. Okay, so there's time for a few minutes of questions, I think. It's going to be hosted by Philip. Do we have any? Yes, over there. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, yeah, it, it, they're almost empty. Yeah, I mean, proving rigorously results about the effectiveness of L1 or maybe if you're talking about matrix problems, the effectiveness of, of the nuclear norm, which we'll bring up in a moment, it really depends critically on the observations having this, this sort of random uh, property. And as you point out, there are a lot of situations where it doesn't. And so these, these um, uh, you know, the theory doesn't hold in those cases. Often, though, you do, you do get pretty good performance of this strategy, even in those situations. But you can only really prove things about it when these when these uh, so-called restricted isometry type properties hold. So it's sort of a heuristic. If you move beyond that, it just becomes a heuristic, but it's a heuristic that often works well in variable selection, so people continue to use it. You can certainly construct cases where it breaks down, though. Um, what is the QX? It's only approximately sparse. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, it can't. It, it won't do a good job at finding the small spikes, okay, particularly if there's noise. Uh, I mean, th the desirable thing in that situation, if you can't recover the signal precisely, at least you'd like to recover the big spikes. And actually, it doesn't work too badly at that. You know, if the small spikes are not contributing very much to the observations, why? It tends to be the big ones that are recovered first. Um, and the small ones just sort of get lost in the noise. So, you know, it, as long as these rip properties are satisfied, it usually does do that. And you can, again, prove stuff about it.